All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Hope you got uh, some uh, some refreshments outside. And uh, you know, this is the last uh, panel and uh, Q and A. And I think this is going to be fantastic closing. So. Mark, and I can't do justice to him, but I'll try anyway. So uh, he went to MIT, uh, Sloan School of Management for his MBA, now is a senior lecturer at Harvard, uh, writing some of those case studies, maybe damn prices that we heard earlier. And um, you know, he's the author of the Sales Acceleration Formula. And he has basically so many people that want to work with him. He gets one company a day, basically, reaching out to him begging him to be an advisor. And currently, the companies that he does work with are HubSpot, Insight Square, Catalan, VTS, Drift, Local Localytics, Rombi, BevSpot, Bounce Exchange, Tiny Pulse, Acquizio, Snack Nation, Chow Now, Love Pop, and Tetra. And those are the only the companies he's had time for. And one of the things that, you know, the biggest impact that he's made on us is how we look at talent acquisition and make it a very data-driven approach. So with that, I want to uh, welcome Mark Roberge on stage. <laughs> Thanks, David. Welcome, Mark. We're sitting. Yeah. OK. Hey, everyone. <laughs> so um, the, the book, The Sales Acceleration Formula, like I told people, came out in 2015. I've already read it three times. So it's the only book in 2015 I've read three times already. And I learned a lot about how to drive more sales. But I think the message in the book was this is, in a nutshell, what Mark did is, so he was an engineer who was hired to run sales for HubSpot. And you correct me if I'm wrong in any of this. And um, so he said, well, I've got to hire a sales team. Well, well, where do I start? Let me have a hypothesis about the characteristics and traits that will produce successful salespeople. Or you can substitute any position. So he came up with these hypotheses that he's going to share with you and quiz us in a second. And then he said, well, now I have my hypothesis. What are the types of questions I'm going to ask to ascertain if they hit those characteristics and traits? And then I'm going to interview for those. And then six months later, he will do a data-driven analysis to see how well these people are performing in their role, and then run a regression analysis. Did we ask the right questions? And uh, I think Henry at Lime said he interviewed 500 people. And he probably thinks he's a really great interviewer, like a lot of us do. But does data say that he was a great interviewer? The people he gave the highest scores, did, were they the most performant or not? Right? So that was the brilliance of the book, is every time we're interviewing someone, we're getting an at bat an ability to see how good we're interviewing and how good we're trying to find the right people, and are we doing well or not? And I'll give you a, a we're just starting this journey ourselves. And recently, we looked at two salespeople we hired. One is no longer with us. The other one is doing superb. And you know the punchline. In the, in the data-driven methodology, the person who scored the highest was the person who's no longer with us. So that was a huge wake-up call. And if there's anything you bring back to your management, your C-suite, this is going to be one of the seminal points. Is like Everyone's going to be talking about how to do this in the next five to 10 years, but you guys were here first. So I'm going to uh, switch it over to Mark. And Mark, why don't you tell us about that hypothesis and yeah. the quiz you want? No, as well said. Um, clearly, you've read the book three times. <laughs> um, so it all stemmed from when I first took the job at HubSpot. It was, we were only four people in a garage. So it was a very small company, and I'd never run sales before. And that first year, I did, um, geez, probably 30 interviews with VPs of sales. And I asked a bunch of questions. What do you look for in a hire? How do you scale the team? How do you set your commission plan? All that kind of stuff. And through a year or two of experience, I realized that asking all those VPs of sales what you look for in a salesperson is a very dangerous question. And here's why. Um, I learned it in my seventh hire. I somehow had convinced when we were 20 people in a room, the number one salesperson at a public company in Boston to quit and join our company. Um, they were making a ton of money, number one out of 800 salespeople. And somehow they were like, I will come join your company. And I was like, this is amazing. Rolled out the red carpet and was like, teach us to sell. Welcome to the company. <laughs> and what was perplexing was they didn't crush it. I mean, they didn't do terribly. They were there for a year, ended up leaving. But it was like, how did that happen? 
the number one salesperson of 800 people comes to this small company where I didn't feel like we knew what we're doing and didn't even crush it. And it was an important lesson for me that's unique to sales, and we have to think about how this applies to other functions, is context matters so much in the ideal hire for selling, right? Like, um, think about where they came from. That person came from a big public company that was literally running Super Bowl ads. Like, when they made the phone call, everybody knew the company, everybody knew what was coming in terms of the pitch, and it was like a five-minute sales process. Think about what HubSpot was at the time. No one had a clue what we were. No one had a clue what inbound marketing was. It was a complete evangelistic sale, and you can imagine that the person that succeeds in the HubSpot environment would be way different than that would succeed in the first environment. And that's what inspired me to be like, let me take a step back and, and see if I can put these things together. And the other thing that is a theme I think that will come up in our conversation quite a bit is, unlike any other function, success and failure is so quantifiable in sales, right? Like, it's really hard to quantify excellence in engineering, in marketing, in <laughs> HR, in finance. But in, fail, in sales, it's highly quantifiable. And this comes through in a lot of the themes we're gonna talk about from coaching to training to management, but definitely hiring. It's like shame on us if we don't leverage that ability and you know, try to quantify the observations we're making in the, in the opening sales process and then run some correlations back to um, you know, success. So this comes in many different flavors. Of course, like you can't wake up one day and have enough data to run a regression analysis. And some of you may only hire, you might be uh, from a 20 or 30 person company and only hire two or three reps in the year. But this approach still, um, this model still applies because at the very least, we should every six months just take a step back and like, you guys lost, you lost one person, right? And one person's crushing it. So what can we learn from that? Exactly. We don't take the time even just to like step back and like, why did that person not work out? Why is that person crushing it? And am I, when I go back to the interview process, did I see that in the interview? If I didn't, why? Am I asking the wrong questions? Am I looking for the wrong abilities? And for some of you who are coming from 100,000, 10,000 employees, you know, I think shame on you if you're not you know, trying to you know, take a data-driven uh, approach to, to some of these insights, especially in sales. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I, we were talking about at, at the very beginning when he started his journey in hiring people and building on his team, so he had some hypothesis of traits, right? And then he had the final set when you actually left the company was over a $100 million run rate. And, I, did, and you said that you wanted to test the audience and give them the five yeah. if they could pick the top one, right? Yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you three of them just so you can consume oh, it. It's so easier. These, these, are, these are in the top five that eventually came out. And again, remember the big asterisk. That's for, for HubSpot's context, not for you. But I do see that they correlate, especially in like high tech. Like for tiny posts, I bet they'd, they correlate pretty well. So one was curiosity, one was um, coachability, and one was um, uh, intelligence. So how many people, one of those is number one. They were all in the top five. So how many people think curiosity was the number one correlator to success in our sales team? In about 25%. How many think it was coachability? How many people think it was intelligence? First audience in a year to get it. Well done. <laughs> I don't know. I'm mostly talking to like um, sales leaders. So <laughs> maybe it's the fact that, that you guys have a different bend on your insights. Coachability was it. And what was crazy about it, curiosity was too. It was coachability, curiosity, uh, intelligence, prior success, and work ethic. Those were the top five for our context. And what was crazy about the coachability one was it wasn't in my first theory of a dozen criteria that I thought I should be looking for. It actually took like a year or two of going through the reflections and the data, and I was like, there's a pattern here. And it was just like, these are people that we keep losing who are crushing it on all the aspects we're looking for, but they're like, when they come here, they're like, Mark, thanks for all the coaching and training, but I've been selling for a decade. I know how to do it. I'll be over at my desk um, doing my thing. And those were the folks that weren't working out. Yeah. And so, you know, coachability became, it's, it's by far the number one uh, characteristic that I drive in, dive into during my interviews. Yeah, and then from the book, his original top three hypothesis was preparation, adaptability, and domain expertise. All 
sound good, right? But for HubSpot, at that life cycle, it wasn't the top three. So that, I think that's what's so fascinating, is we all have, and it might be different for different roles okay. as well, in different totally. life stages, but I have assumptions about what makes a great hire at Tiny Pulse, and now we're starting to uncover, is that related to actual outcomes? So for a salesperson, it's very data-driven or customer success, but for other functions, you have a, uh, now we have perform, we have an idea, are these high performing people? We can just say yes or no and start looking for still that data driven approach about, wow, are these people meeting our expectations and are they high performers? So, what, one, so now, you know, we've explained the basic construct. When do you start looking back? When, I mean, do you look at it three months after they're hired, six months, nine months, 12 months, or when yeah. are those checkpoints? When is too little, when is too much yeah. to start doing that? Again, I think context plays a big role there. I mean, if you're, if you're an enterprise sales play with a 12-month sales cycle, it's gonna take you 12 to 18 months, to maybe even longer, to know if these people are even working out. So to look back on that six months in isn't worthwhile. For someone like Tiny Pulse or maybe HubSpot where sales cycles are maybe three to four or five weeks, um, then it could be more of a six month uh, timeline. Um, so for us, we, we, we basically looked six months. And then again, it also depends on stage. Like when we were 20, 30, 40 people, it was more of a qualitative reflection. It was like, okay, we hired, you know, we hired five or six people six months ago. What are the trends? When we were a couple hundred people, it, the stats started to play and we measured it across the whole team and kept that going every six months. Now we're 1,500 people and some of you up to five, 10, 50,000 people. Um, I would do both. I would look at the aggregate mm -hmm. to see if the market's changing. Like maybe you used to be uh, in, you know, more of a, you know, a, a nice a lone player sale and now it's gotten really competitive so has that shifted who's succeeding or not i want to look at that and i also want to look at it by cohort yep. to see if like you know maybe it's too hard to start today maybe we're giving too much of advantage to our tenured salespeople and new people can't break in or maybe um we've gotten sloppy on our hiring mm -hmm. right so you know I'd, I'd, I'd look at both for the larger organizations the cohort and the mass analysis yeah, that's a great point yeah. And, and you know, the most important thing that we can do is hire great people. Well, the second is inspiring and training them. And you have a very, very regimented training process. And I think someone told me that most high school football teams are better run than your company. And I'm like, <laughs> that's probably true, right? So, but yeah. you have a really great playbook. And yeah. so share with me the amount of investment, because I remember I emailed Mark and I'm like, hey, you know, what's the right cadence? And he's, you know, he, then he starts spouting wisdom. It depends and, you know, a lot about, you know, and then it's also driven by the employee and not from the manager down, but there's a kind of an agreement yeah. so that you're teaching them how to fish and looking for their own deficiencies where they need to improve. So can you share yeah, some sure. of that philosophy? Yeah, so um, the first point is um, if I, if I let's, talk, let's talk in sales for a second and extrapolate it to the other functions. Um, I believe the biggest, the most important function of the frontline sales management layer is good coaching. And I rarely see it prioritized as well as it should be. Like for some reason when I go out and talk to sales managers, they're spending most of their time just managing the forecast. And it's like we have technology to do that today, right? And like I don't know why they do that. You, you should be maximizing your time developing those people. That's going to be the biggest driver of productivity. So that's an important point, maximize coaching from sales managers. Then the question is, well, what's great coaching? And um, I often draw an analogy to the great game of golf, something that I've tried to learn for 20 years without much success. <laughs> um, but let's, let's compare two golf pros giving me a lesson. And one golf pro is like, Mark, take a swing. And I do, and he's like, okay, here's what I want you to do. Turn your grip over a little bit. Lean more on your right foot. Uh, and, and lean back in your stance a little bit. Think one o'clock, not two o'clock on your backswing, and give me more wrist on contact. And like, wh where do I start? You know, like, it's a little overwhelming. And another golf pro would be like, okay, Mark, take a swing. And then it's like, okay, why don't you try this grip, right? And, and take 100 swings with that grip. Right? And 20 minutes later, it's like, well, how does that feel? I'm like, oh, that feels pretty good. All right, now let's try leaning back in your stance a little bit. Take another 100 swings. And it's a really simple example. It's like, duh. But I've promoted 19 reps to managers, and all of them have taken 
the first Golf Pros approach and literally like gotten this new salesperson at training, saw the 50 things that were broken with them and threw up on them for 90 minutes with like <laughs> all this feedback. And you can just see the reps' heads spinning in, like nothing gets done. Nothing gets done because they don't know where to focus. And so that was one of my big insights on what good coaching was. And especially getting back to sales is like, um, it's, it's proper, you know, see the 50 things, but properly, di proper, properly diagnose the one area or the two areas that are going to make the biggest improvement in the short term and then move on to the next one. And again, getting back to our philosophy of sales, success, and failure is so quantifiable, shame on us if we don't lean into the metrics to drive that diagnosis, right? So um, when I go and talk to a, man, a sales rep, I'm like, oh, why is Bob, why is Bob on your team suffering? Every manager is like, they need more calls. They need more activity. It's the default. And so a lot of times the data doesn't suggest that, nope. right? So, um, so that's where it starts for, for with us is um, every month, this is, here's our cadence, um, our managers, 10 days before the start of the month, will set their first day up with one-on-one -on -one calls, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with their team. Um, and uh, basically, the, the rep would come in and say, David, you know, how, you know, and first it's a qualitative assessment. How did you do last month? I, I noticed you came at 120%, pat on the back, that's great. How'd you do? What did you do well? You, what could you have improved on? Then we move to the quant every single month. I'm like, okay, here's the number of calls you made relative to everybody else. Looks like you're in the top 10%. Wow. How'd you do that? And that's a learning moment for me as the manager and coach because I want to know, maybe when I was a rep, I wasn't the best activity guy. Clearly, David is. How does he do that? Because I'm going to come across some people who aren't great activity guys. Maybe they can sit down with David, or maybe I can learn what great activity guys do. And then we get to his um, opportunity to close rate. It's like, ooh, you're in the bottom five. So what's going on there? Right? And so, and we keep going and keep going and look at their trends. And then at the end, it's like, so we've done a qualitative assessment and you've done a quantitative assessment on your performance. What is the area you'd like to work on this month? And then how would you like my help with that? Right? And then, okay, great. We're going to, we're going to work on sense of urgency. And what you want me to do is let's, let's have you record three discovery calls this month and I will listen to them and we'll listen together and do coaching. So let's schedule the coaching right here in this meeting. Right? It looks like we're available on Thursday at 9, the following Wednesday at 3, and the last Friday at 4 o'clock. Great, let's book those. Your homework is to show up with three calls. We'll listen to, to, to them together. So there's a lot of stuff that happened in there. Number one, as David pointed out, it wasn't like I walked in like, David, great month, but you suck at urgency development, and here's what we're going to do, right? It was a very much like the rep was self-diagnosing, which helps their body in, and I'm teaching them how to think. Yeah. So that it doesn't have to wait till the, the monthly meeting. They're able to do it. Uh, and the other thing that's happening as a manager is I am proactively booking what we just concluded was the most important execution of my job, which is coaching. It's one of those things that's so easy to be in reactive mode all the time and never get to the coaching. But because we had the cadence of every you know, first day of the month, I'm mm -hmm. going to do this meeting, all my coaching is booked for the month. And yeah, if, if we were booked at 4 o'clock and you got this awesome CEO pitch, we'll move the meeting, but we'll move it, yeah. not cancel it. Right? So we get that booked in. Now, as someone sitting on top of a, a sales force of 500 people, how do you instill that culture of coaching? I would sit down on the second day of every month meet with all my directors for 90 minutes who had five managers and 50 reps under them and say, let's go through every name. What are you working on them on? Why did you choose that? And how are you coaching? And that obviously create a great amount of accountability to the whole organization around coaching. And in my seat and also my director's seats, we became experts at coaching plans. Right, like I did that for three months. I never saw another diagnosis that I hadn't seen before. Wouldn't pick up the phone, not enough activity, bad sense of urgency development, you know, all this stuff. I'd saw it a million times. And I knew that, like, you know, Sue just had a great experience coaching Brian on that issue three months ago, and it went well. So, guess what? Go talk to Sue, find out what she did, and have your rep have a coffee with Brian. 
and you start to see those patterns, right? So that's an example of a cadence that you know, we use really effectively in, in sales and maybe it applies to support and marketing and account management and even engineering and other places. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I've got a ton of questions I could ask Mark, so, but I'm gonna ask one more and then we're gonna open up for uh, Q&A. Is, you know, one of the things with a data-driven approach that you can do is you can um, create a, a culture of, a, of experimentation. Because you're exp at every experiment is giving you feedback, like, that doesn't work, that's feedback, I'm not gonna try that again, or that does work. So, and I know that Brent Halligan, CEO at HubSpot, is also a big believer. And um, so I'm curious as to, you know, if there's a, a person that wants their company to have um, a more, uh, uh, embrace a culture of more experimentation, what type of advice would you give yeah. the CEO, the head of HR, the GM? Sure. Um, number one, the success of the experiment is the learning, not the, like, measuring success of the experiment is not whether it worked, but the learning that came from it. Yep. Right? So, Otherwise, you, you have a lot of pressure on the people of like, oh, I hope this works because my career is bet on it. But we rewarded people based on whether they ran a good experiment we learned from it. Even if it failed, we rewarded people for that because we learned about our business model. So that's the first thing is just run well. And then the second is just run them well. And it sounds like it's really basic stuff. Remember back to like sixth grade when we learned the scientific method. You need a good control group. You need to define the goal. You need to quantify what success and failure is. It's pretty basic like that. It's like, you'd be surprised how many experiments don't do that. And if you don't define that goal, you don't have a really um, non-contaminated control group, you don't learn anything. And you forget halfway through the project what you were even setting out to do. So that, it takes a lot of sort of scientific thought going in of like, how can we do this? And I guess the last thing I'd share is like, the best experiments are those that can be run quickly with enormous upside, mm -hmm. right? Like if I could tell you that you could run an experiment that you'll know the answer in 60 days, and it would increase sales by 50% potentially. You'd run those experiments all day. If I had another experiment that takes a year to know, and it has a 5% impact on sales, you'd never run it, right? So just be aware of that lens of like, you know, the quicker the learning with the upside, that's how I sort of look at the experiments we wanna go after. Great, great. So um, Preem, um, so we'll, oh, we got a question up here first. Hello, I'm Mary from hey, Mary. Seattle. Um, and my question is, how do you vet out coachability in your interview yeah, process? Sure. Yeah, so um, uh, role plays are an enormous piece to the, any, I think, sales interviews. Um, and, you know, probably about 15 minutes into the, to the interview after like some warm up stuff, like, why are you interested in HubSpot? And where do you want to be in your career later? And all this kind of stuff. I'll set up a role plan. I set it up around HubSpot, right? It's like, you know, Mary, you're going to be um, a salesperson at HubSpot. I will play the VP of marketing at a security software company. And um, I had filled out a form, downloaded an ebook on inbound marketing last night, and it's your lead. So tell me when you're ready. Let's go. And I'll watch, like, you know, do they start off the call? with what I call show up and throw up, which is basically like, <laughs> basically dumping 10 minutes of information that I could have read on the website, I hate that. I, I like consultative sellers where you ask me about my goals and dig in. Um, and then, uh, then I'll try to school you with like an SEO question to see how much you've picked up on our, our information. Uh, and then, you know, we'll stop the role play after 10 minutes and I'll say, okay, Mary, how do you think you did? I like to do the self-assessment. And if Mary's like, I was awesome, I'm not really that psyched about that answer. <laughs> you know, I'm like, kind of want, even if she was, I mean, I, no one's ever perfect. I'll role play and I won't do it perfectly. I want someone that's a little bit like self-aware and self-diagnosis. And then I say, okay, in every interview, I give one area of where you did well and one area where you can improve. Because I don't want them to freeze up and feel like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm bombing this thing, right? So I want to say, every interview, this is how I do it. And I'll give a positive view, you're really good, your SEO information was great. And then here's where you'd want to improve. And usually it's around the depth of their discovery. And I'll get up on the whiteboard and be like, here's a model we use. We use GPCT. And it's like an interactive thing. How would you, if you had that moment back, what would you ask? What would you do diff differently? And I can see like if they're taking notes. And, you know, like, <laughs> like I like you know, that. And they're, like, Every interview. they're asking me questions like, hey, this is going well. And if they're like nodding their head and not really getting it and they're glassy-eyed, I'm like, I'm not really getting through here. 
And then I have them redo the role play. Now, everyone bombs that. It's super stressful. You're, head, you're at the head of global sales. You want this job. <laughs> but like, the effort is what matters. And hey, if they actually improve, hire that person. I mean, like, yeah, there's other things I have to check off. But like, when I've seen improvement in that interview, those are the people that want off and better. I mean, I coached them in 15 minutes. Imagine what it's going to be like if I have a day, a week, a month with them. Mm. Right? So, so that's what I do is do the role play, the self-assessment, the coaching exercise. You know, to some degree, like, especially in sales, I encourage sale, um, companies to think about the sales hiring process like the start of training. Like, I've seen so many people like, oh, yeah, this person didn't work out. I'm like, when did you know they weren't going to work out? It's like the first day of training. I'm like, really? How did that? You invested four rounds of interviews, and then the first day of training, you mm -hmm. realized, you know, it's just like, let's just replicate the training as part of the interview. So I've had companies I advise like literally share first weeks of training material and be doing training during the interview. Like, hey, here's the first role play. Here's some what you need to work on. Come back in two days. Let's do it again. And that information is passed to the next you know, recruiter. So that's, that's my process. Hi, Mark. Matt from uh, Tiny Pulse. Oh, I, I thought Long it was time God. Listener, I was like, I didn't know caller. where you were. <laughs> First time caller, long time listener. Yeah, good to you. Um, question for you, your sales acceleration formula when you, uh, when you developed it, how did it impact other teams at HubSpot in terms of, did, you know, did it, did, was there a product acceleration formula that came out of it? It was interesting yeah. how that changed HubSpot. Um, great question. I don't think it changed a lot just because we were already so immersed in this. You know, I mean, I have to give a lot of credit to the foundation of the book to my CEO, Brian Halligan, who is also a fellow MIT guy, who made sure I didn't get swayed into the masses of VP of sales think, and kept me true to like, do it differently. Mm. Lean into your numbers. And he pushed every leader in that way. So um, I don't think that actually publication of the book influenced it, but what did influence it is, in most organizations, in a lot of organizations, this is true, true in, sale, in a HubSpot, the sales team was the first to scale up. So the sales team was the first to have to care about hiring cadences, trading cadences, coaching cadences. And through that, that highly impacted the other functions. So as other ones howling, like, why don't you go talk to Robert? She's kind of got that down. And, and so it, it, certainly, uh, it certainly impacted the other departments through that, that route. Hi, Robert. Uh, from Seattle. So you mentioned uh, top traits of salespeople. One of the traits you, you talked about was coachability and then of course work ethic and intelligence. I uh, agree 100%, but something I encounter with my own team is no matter how coachable somebody is, we can run into accountability issues. So um, it's my personal premise that accountability is one of the most important traits in a salesperson or indeed in any, any individual in an uh, organization. What I've struggled with is whether or not accountability can be taught or learned. Yeah. And I'm curious your take on that. And also whether you agree. Yeah. Can you, can you give me a sentence on accountability just so I can, what is it? Yeah, to me, uh, coachability is I'm the one pointing out the deficiency. Yeah. Um, you know, okay. perhaps it's style. Accountability is they're able to point that out on their own. They're yeah. able to recognize right. it and own it. Yeah, the way you define it, I like it a lot. I think in my... I think I wrap that into coachability, personally. So to, to, to pull that out, um, I think, is, is great. And um, I, I definitely um, uh, find that as well. I don't know if I've gone to the mountain a bit on like how I'm actually teasing that out on the interview. Maybe outside of like the role play, I think you saw the way I did it. Um, there's a little bit of like their humbleness can come through. Um, and maybe there's like, um, there's certainly a lot of like, especially between the interview cycles, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, like when you do give them some feedback and they come back and you give them some reading, like how much they come at that. Maybe there's even like, and I definitely actually see this and, and it, it wasn't, didn't come on the top five, but like when you're going through their past experiences, I hate it when people blame the company or not mm -hmm. themselves. And I think that's related to what you're going at here versus like, when they tell these stories about failure or whatever, and they, here's where I learned, that says a lot to me about accountability. So, yeah, I haven't gone to the mountain as much in that one, but now that we reflect on it, it's interesting. There was another question around here earlier. Yeah, right here. 
Hi, Harry from Seattle. So a lot of people, managers make the mistake when they promote salespeople to managers because they promote their great sales yeah. salespeople. So yeah. how did you kind of, uh, obviously you'd have to change how you think about that. How, yeah. how did you do that then yeah. make those decisions and mm -hmm. then all the way up? It's a great question. Commonly know when you dive into sales, like you can't promote your best salesperson. Don't promote your best salesperson to manager. You can't promote your worst one either, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a very, very tricky uh, question. In fact, one of my students this semester provoked me on a great question. It's like, why? She's like, do you think that's unique to sales, or do you think that also happens in engineering and marketing? I'd love to talk to some of you afterwards about that. And the only thing that we could come up with on why it might be exaggerated in sales is gets back to that philosophy of success and failure is so measurable. That like maybe when we look at an engineering team and think about our future leaders, maybe we naturally think about like communication skills and teamwork as opposed to like lines of code and stuff. But maybe when we look at our sales team, we're somehow like tarnished by the fact that they're the best. And maybe that might cause it. So again, like you can't promote your best, but you also can't promote your worst. And the reason I think um, that it, it fails is when we think about a great salesperson, it's not unusual to like associate them with egotistical, aggressive. These are not great management traits. <laughs> um, so you have to look for that, like, that broader perspective. The first thing I did was I said, OK, you want to be a manager. First, I need to see you with a good grasp of the entire sales process. Because I have reps who are amazing, but they're just great at activity, and they kind of suck at everything else. They would be a really bad manager, because they'd hire everybody like them, and God forbid someone actually struggle with sense of urgency development, they'd no, have no idea how to coach them through it. So I don't need you to be the best at every element, but I need you to have like a really well-rounded grasp of the entire sales process. That's step one. Then um, step two is I would put them through a sales leadership curriculum. I just downloaded things from like Center for Crea Creative Center for Leadership, CCL.org, Harvard Business Review. I actually published it in the book and it's publicly on a blog article that if you search for my name and sales leadership curriculum, you can find it. Um, and just like, you know, basically have them do some readings on managing conflict and that kind of stuff and then role play that stuff, bringing it to the HubSpot context. And then most importantly, if we got through all that, and sometimes that, that exercise, we're like, you know what, I don't even want to do this. This is like not interesting to me. Um, and then the final piece was, all right, you've made it through the whole thing. What we're going to do in the next three months is I'm going to give you the next hire. Right? So you work for, for Janet, but you're going to get her next hire. You're going to go through the interview process. You're going to hire the person. Of course, we'll be here checking, vetoing, all that kind of stuff. And you're going to mentor the hire for the first three months, watch them through training, coach them. And by the way, you still have your whole productivity because like, this is sales management. It's all about time management. You're going to have eight, 10 of these people running around. Having one is a piece of cake. And so we watch how they do. How do they coach? How do they mentor? And then they get to feel it out. And if they go through all that, they proved to me the well-roundedness. They got through the leadership scenarios. And then they actually executed the hire, the training. Um, then I feel pretty good about it. So I think. In reflection, it was all about building up that leadership pipeline. And hopefully, I gave you some suggestions on like places to look. Okay. So um, I'll ask one, one last question, and um, is you, you talk about running contests to change behavior. And I believe the, the, the key points on running the contest to change behavior were uh, you like that it, it had to be aligned uh, with what the company's trying to achieve. It had to be team-based. It couldn't be individual. And the prize had to be shared as a team. And then you said updated nightly. And the length of the contest to try to change whatever behavior should be about one week to one quarter in length. So can you give the audience an example of a behavior you're trying to, try to change and then what you did and the outcome of that? Yeah, sure. So. Um Sales contests surprised me so much about how amazing they were to drive behavior and results, and how they're a little different than a comp plan, which also are effective at doing that, is they can be very short-term focused. Right? Like, let's say that we were coming into the summer months, and we were concerned about having some seasonality in our revenue stream. Well, we can run a contest in June on like new opportunity creation that hopefully would translate into 
you know, offsetting any sort of seasonality in our business. We wouldn't want to bake that into a comp plan. It's more of a short-term thing. Maybe we have a new product coming out. We can run some contests on it. So they're really great. Um, they were also so good at driving team culture, which I was surprised about. Um, most sales contests were situated like, one winner, you get a trip to Hawaii, or one winner, you get $10,000. All my contests in the first three years were teams with a team prize. Right? So here's 20 reps. Um, here's the contest. There's five teams of four people. Whoever, whichever team wins gets, um, we're going to go, and I don't know the HR sensitivity on this, but like we put them in a limo, fully stocked with alcohol, and $1,000 of gambling money each going down to the casino together. And that was a lot of fun. I mean, what's it cost you? 5000 bucks. You got four people, $1,000 of gambling money with a stocked limo. It's 5000 bucks, and it was well worth it in terms of the upside that we created. And they came back with amazing stories and photos, and it's a great, it was a great time. Um, so the contest, and it was funny, because three years in, I was like, you know what? I need a big month. Let me try that individual contest. And I did it. I think I had like 40 reps. And I was like, the number one rep's going to get $10,000. Second prize is $5,000. And that was like a month's paycheck for them. And that was the first month we had backstabbing on the team. Like, oh, this person's cheating. That person's. Because up until then, the team won. People were staying late, helping each other, you know, just because they wanted their team to win, mm -hmm. right? So, so the, the, there are a lot of contest stories in there. One of them was my team was so bad at forecasting. They were like, this one's definitely coming in. This one's definitely coming in. So I was like, all right, here's what we're going to do. This month, you do a demo. And it's, again, it's a pretty transactional sale. Uh, you do a demo. If you, after the demo, if you think that deal is going to come in this month, write the deal on the board and put a score next to it up to 100, 70, 80, 100, whatever. And um, at the end of the month, what we're going to do is we're going to see, of all those you put on the board, we're going to circle the ones that came in, add up those scores. But any that didn't come in, cross off, and we'll subtract the score. And if you, if you close one that's not on the board, I'll just give you a free 20 points, OK? The winner that, that month, negative 70 points. That was the winner. <laughs> and they were like, all right, Roberts, you got us. We suck at forecasting. <laughs> and so you know, we were able to bake that stuff in. But like, that was a, an example of a, you know, a great contest. And you can get really creative with these. Got it. So um, since you're the last speaker, I um, want you to be able to share some uh, maybe parting words with these folks, especially because you get to see so many aspiring leaders coming through um, Harvard Business School. Yeah. You get to coach a, lo a lot of CEOs and, and leaders. Yeah. Is uh, you know, What are the themes and maybe the last words that you would share yeah. with this audience? I just think appreciate this moment right here, because I can think back, like, as, a, as an entrepreneur for two decades, <clears throat> a few years into my entrepreneurial <laughs> journey, one great CEO told me, I really only want to start companies that represent a movement. I didn't understand what that meant. It sounded like political, like a politician. I was like all into tech and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, over time, I got to know what that really meant. Is like There are products and companies that are like add-ons and features. But like those end up interesting. They don't change the world. But then there's a lot of great companies that literally change the world in their movement. And I, I feel like I live through them with HubSpot with the inbound marketing movement, and it changed the way we thought about demand gen. And I feel like we're in the midst of another movement that this you're a big part of and this group is a big part of. And I just, that would be my message is appreciate this moment, because I remember this moment in 2008, our first conference with 150 people. Um, and today it's 20,000, and it's the whole movements in Wikipedia, and it's talked about all the time. And um, it's just not, not just David and Tiny Pulse, but it's like, the relationships and the discussions you've had are laying the foundation for something that's really important. So, you know, really appreciate this moment. Wow. Well said. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs>